I'm Amy Schmidt. I'm going to uh, moderate this session, hopefully. Um, <laughs> Aaron Cordes is here to help me. Um, you would think with a room full of engineers, we would we'll be able to make this work. So we'll see what we can do. Um, so we're just a little bit behind. Um, I want to make sure that Dr. Sharara has time here. So we may go just a little bit long on his if we need to and then shorten up later. But um, Mahmoud Sharara from North Carolina State University, and I'm going to turn this over to him and let him get started. Thank you, Amy. OK. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. Um, Mahmoud Sharara, I'm Assistant Professor, Extension Specialist, uh, Specialist at North Carolina State University. And I will talk to you today about using greenhouse structures um, for uh, sludge management, um, dewatering, and uh, pathogen reduction. Uh, this is a project and I work on with some of my colleagues. Um, I hope to be much further in the project, but um, happy to present to you where we're at at the moment. Um, quickly, um, once I know how to advance the slides, I will. <laughs> Uh, I'll give you a brief overview of our swine uh, production in the southeastern United States, North Carolina, and Virginia. Um, our system is three components, three pieces, the barns, lagoons, and spray fields, um, unlike the deep pit systems in the Midwest. Um, our lagoons are primarily for storage treatment and some of the flushing, and our spray fields are primarily for managing the effluent, um, the liquid part of what is in the lagoon. Um, our lagoons interact with the environment through rainfall and evaporation. And some of the water loss happens as evaporation of the barn, but a small portion. Our lagoons are not just storage. They are storage and treatment. Therefore, there is a portion that's constantly have manure. And over long -term periods of time, uh, residue or sediment build in to the lagoon. And that's really our sludge. Um, it, it accumulates over time and creates a management um, uh, limitation over as it increases in volume. As you can see, it effectively reduces the volume available for um, treatment and storage. So it is a byproduct of um, anaerobic digestion. And if you can see on the slide here, um, on the right hand side, you will see the X axis is the depth of the lagoon. As you move uh, from the surface of the liquid all the way down, you're essentially increasing the concentration of solids and um, to a treatment zone and beyond that to a sludge layer. Over periods of time, that sludge layer approaches the surface and reduces the uh, treatment capability of the lagoon. Uh, one of the challenges we have with our sludge management is that unlike typical swine manure that is managed from deep pits, it's nitrogen to phosphorus ratio, it's much lower than uh, typical, which means that nitrogen-based application is not recommended. And that leads to an issue with identifying acreage to uh, utilize these nutrients. And that ties really well to our, the keynote we heard earlier today about some of the sediment, how nutrients take different shapes depending on the management system. So really sludge conventionally can be managed as you've seen here as a, uh, using a pump and haul, basically resuspending the sediment and hauling it to tanker sort of land application or more advanced management would be to add a polymer and use the watering bags to essentially concentrate a lot of these solids into a higher solid fraction. Alternatively, excavation, it's less practice, uh, higher risk of puncturing liners or compromising lagoon berms. But for, for reference, uh, those three practices create two different types of sludge. Some are low solids, six to 10%. And as you can see here on the left-hand side, that gives you sort of an idea of nitrogen to phosphorus uh, ratios. We have a significantly higher phosphorus in that sludge compared to the nitrogen. More so when we start to dewater and we have closer to 20% solids, you can be up to 67 pounds per ton, uh, P2O5, compared to only uh, 10 or less pounds of nitrogen. And that becomes a real uh, challenge, especially also in our swine operations that are a nurseries and that incorporate a higher percentage of uh, zinc uh, in the diets that really translate directly to an increased risk uh, of mineral uh, issues with the sludge application. If we stepped outside of the farm boundaries and we looked into the region, you will start to, to observe that in the southeastern United States, we have an issue. And in that recent study that this figure is from on the right hand side, that kind of illustrates the manure shed where a lot the area is needed to utilize the phosphorus, essentially to break even between the sources and the sinks of phosphorus, tells you that we have very limited acreage to where these high phosphorus solids can move forward. 
And we also have a very large poultry sector in, in the southeastern United States to where there is a competition for acreage for, for land applied manure. That really tells us that the sludge with the characteristics I described to you um, are a challenge to distribute wider. Uh, and we know that we do not have local land resources for its management. So it is challenged both on the farm scale and on a regional level. And the sludge water content is the primary barrier to reduce the mileage that it can travel. We all know that this is the biggest barrier for manure transport and distribution. And our really, the two key questions we looked at is, uh, what is the potential for drying to alleviate this issue? And at the same time, implementing it economically? And are there any opportunities to further improve the cost of this uh, process? Um, I'll give you a brief overview of uh, how we approach that project. And again, as I iterate, that project is still um, uh, in progress. So I'll, I'll be look forward to update you all. But the first component was really looking into commercial drying systems that are already in the market. And that was work we've done with the collaboration with an integrator, looking into systems um, to dry at scale, large scale enough. And what we've done here is comparing costs and the operation considerations for these commercial drying systems. And the second part, we started to look into using greenhouse structures as drying beds or alternatives, using two streams of sludge, some starting from a very low solids, uh, 8% is the benchmark number we talked about, or 20%. I'll start with the evaluation or the commercial evaluation of drying systems. Um, drying in general is, is a technology already well established in the wastewater treatment and municipal biosolids, less so in our agricultural systems. And one of the uh, points we have it, with the capacity of the sector down in the east part of the United States, we have capacity enough to where we can support a large intensive drying system. And in working with the uh, integrator, we approached four different technology vendors. And the request was to furnish us with bids detailing the system um, using specific uh, conditions, starting first with the high sol sludge solids, starting with 20% solids and shooting for only 8% um, uh, moisture or 90% solids. So that's really the efficiency of that drying systems that you need to take care of with a throughput of 20,000 tons of dry matter per year. So again, the, con the concept for this would be a regional technology to be implemented to serve multiple farms as a cluster. And uh, the bid details, we requested details about the capital, the cost of the equipment, the installation, as well as labor, energy, um, uh, also uh, treatment of the emissions or stack emissions, whether it's particulate matter, odor, is there any condensate that will require additional management? Um, using these, we basically analyze them and we put them side by side to be able to reach at the cost per ton of dried material that we can then turn around and talk to our, look into our production systems, how it's being managed today and whether that's an acceptable number. So I'll briefly walk you through some of these technologies. Um, we started with a rotary drum dryer for, for the engineers in the room. It's a common piece of equipment in a lot of uh, drying systems. And uh, what you can see here that there is no water recovery or capture. And the last part at the bottom shows you the capacity or the cost of the equipment on the lower left hand side. Uh, what I want you to keep uh, track of is the cost of equipment, uh, capital investment, as well as the heat and power consumption for every ton of water removed. So that's the, really the first unit that we looked into. The other system was a steam, superheated steam. That's a more intensive capital infrastructure. But for the same parameters, the cost almost tripled uh, to 6.4 mil. Uh, the energy uh, heat consumption is comparable, but the electricity consumption is much greater. Um, we jumped into a belt dryer system. Uh, both the second and third systems um, condensate the liquid. In other words, that system will have to take on the management of the water that has been evaporated as well. And we're seeing the cost, uh, they have been or organized or arranged in a progressive cost. The last option here is a, a cyclone drying. So it's really high electricity consumption, very low heat consumption, and it's really high air movement that is used to create an abrasive uh, uh, force with the material moving and effect of the drying. So really, when we looked at this uh, wide, broad um, scale of technologies, in addition to the quotes, we had conversations with each vendor to know the compatibility of the system to the material we're handling and the operator's experience with it. 
And really what I want to draw your attention here to is the cost when we bring everything to an even comparison basis. What you're looking at here is those four technologies and the cost uh, per ton of dried material produced. And you're looking at it broken down by capital, electricity, heat, and labor. And you can see uh, easily heat and capital investment is of the two largest pieces of cost associated with this system. And that does not take into consideration two important pieces of that puzzle. First is that the cost of actually getting the material to that central point, and that aggregation cost is a significant number, as well as the cost of managing the water or the uh, condensate that is available at site. So really, uh, even though it's an attractive technology and the material can potentially travel longer, we see the prices from 100 tons to 170 and additional costs that have not been considered. That has really been the driver to try to pursue what about the lower cost options for the drying? Where can, what can we do with the low input technologies? And that gets us to the um, greenhouse structures. So really uh, this work started with a pilot system that we uh, sampled and built at campus at NC State. And um, you can see here the system, um, essentially it is a drying bed and we used a mechanical agitation system you can see it pictures here on the right hand side. It's essentially uh, mechanical ventilation and there is a sweeping mechanism to spread that 8% um, solids and it's used to harvest it at the end. We conducted two different tests to get an idea of the loading rate of this material and how fast it dries uh, under the Southeastern conditions. And the, if you look at the lower uh, right hand corner, the red dots are where we place temperature and humidity probes inlet different points through the system and outlet to be able to conduct a water balance as it moves through the system and as well as understand the energy gain during the drying. Um, I'll walk you through the results um, first for the low sludge addition rates. Uh, what you're seeing on the right hand side of this slide is the temperature over 48 hours. Um, and you can see the times from zero being the start of the experiment. And the lower figure is the humidity. Temperature and humidity have inverse trends, as you can see. Uh, I wanted to draw your attention to the red color at the upper right compared to the black. Red color is the ambient air temperature compared to the black color representing the air temperature averages inside the greenhouses. Essentially, we're using that as an indication of the evaporative cooling that is associated with the drying effect, basically water evaporation. And the, you'll see the inverse is that the same line has a higher humidity concentration. And we've seen that fluctuations during the, the variability in temperature and humidity along the bed significantly during daytime, less so at nighttime. Same trends we've observed here during uh, the higher sludge addition rate. We've doubled the addition rates or density of addition per unit area. And we've observed the variability. One point I wanna uh, draw your attention to when you're comparing the red and black colors, basically two different temperatures outside and inside is to observe as the, proc uh, the process approaches completion, there is no drying effect uh, remaining. Both of these temperatures and humidities overlay, essentially indicating that there isn't uh, any uh, drying uh, or water removal happening inside these systems. We've also experimented with the effect of tillage or mixing the material, and we've observed slight increases in water removal, evidenced by humidity and cooling of the air. And finally, this is really an important takeaway here to look at, which basically shows you uh, the duration of a long test. On the x-axis, you will see hours of an uh, uh, experiment. On the y-axis, you see the water carrying capacity for uh, unit volume of air. And you will see the, the dotted line in blue, that represents the air water carrying maximum water removal potential. Our solid line represents what we actually are removing in terms of uh, the system is able to carry during the drying process. So that looking at this two lines together gives us a clear idea of where is the efficiency of air utilization or air water removal efficiency. Um, and we are about 21%, essentially 21% of our air circulation. Um, we're utilizing that for water removal. Sort of a, a quick summary of in terms of drying rates, and we are using, we're benchmarking our drying rates in units of water removed per unit area, unit time. And these are the numbers we are trying to track long term to get an idea of the performance of the system. And along with that, on the right hand side, you see the analysis of the material resulting from the drying. 
tests uh, along with the, a, a nutrient concentration. You'll see that we have a significantly high phosphorus concentration in these materials. We are talking about a hundred pounds a ton. And we've also observed that initial tests are pointing to a very low um, fecal coliform in the dried material, but we have not yet conducted a long-term uh, experiments to observe the dynamics of this. And how is the termination temperature moisture content impact to this? We all know that it's a dynamic relationship between the uh, thermal dosage or the thermal treatment and the amount of moisture in the, in the manure or the sludge. And those are really critical points uh, for what is coming uh, after that. Um, to sort of give you a summary of what we've done with these greenhouses and how they compare to the systems we talked about earlier, um, putting together the capital expenditure for the system and the operating cost, we are looking at close to $40 a dry ton. Uh, compared to these costs that we've observed for before, without this system also avoids the need to actually move the material from source farm to a centralized site. So that cost disappears. The second cost of water removal after condensation is non-existent. So really it is a, is a much more uh, economically attractive option and scalable for farm um, use on uh, individual farms without the need for aggregation. So sort of the quick sum up, um, drying, we know drying is an energy intensive process, uh, more so using conventional technologies. We've observed um, drying rates closer to uh, 250 to 260 grams a square meter an hour. Um, and we've seen that the comparing the system under these parameters is much more economically attractive than conventional technologies. And we're actively collecting more data on the, the safety of this material for wider distribution as the end goal. A brief overview of where we are for the next steps of the system. We are looking into, um, have to report we have about 10,000 uh, square foot system that is already up and running and uh, an integrator already committed to that with many operators looking into uh, installing this system. And we are tracking uh, energy use and drying rates to have a more robust estimate of the uh, design parameters for these systems. With that, um, I'd like to take any of your questions and thank a lot of the funding agencies that helped us do that work. Thank you all. Is there any concern about that, That's an excellent question. Um, the uh, primary concern I had initially was ammonia or an elevated ammonia level. However, it's actually the exposure to high temperature and humidity. And that has been the primary risk that we've observed. So really, uh, a lot of the units that you've seen at full scale already have garage doors open to allow in a lot of the, uh, the temperature humidity risk for an individual. We have not observed emissions, uh, noticeable emissions, because it's a very stable material. You had a question? We start with a primarily organic nitrogen, uh, very little uh, ammonium nitrogen. Uh, we notice a slight the disappearance of whatever percentage that is ammonium from the system. And the uh, uh, priority focus for us right now is to track the emissions, GHG, but also ammonia as well. Thank you. Sir. Yes. In the last slide, show the tractor agitate. Yes. It is, a, a, it is a batch process. So the greenhouse system would be a batch. So really it depends on the loading rate and that impacts the turnaround. Essentially it's a semi-batch. Um, lower addition rate will be a 24 to 48 hour. Whereas adding close to eight to 10 inches of depth of material that increases the cycle time. Yes. 